express yourself the right way. And we're going to be going forward and try to get some sort of resolution about all these issues. So thanks for tolerating me again. Thanks for being here. This is my colleague, uh, Mr. Jim Harris, and thanks for the lecture. Jim. Thanks, Nelson. Thank you all for coming. You can tell uh, we're in a church since we have a number of people sitting in the back. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite welcome to come up and be closer to us. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. And, uh, of course, uh, as Nelson said, uh, we're very grateful for the Department of Justice uh, showing up to hear the concerns. And uh, part of the reason uh, that I understand the Department of Justice came is because we have had issues with the police, as you know, very serious issues and a number of killings. And there are other issues in the community. And uh, we asked uh, the Department of Justice to look at the police department again, as did the city, asked the Department of Justice. And the response was, well, we've helped you before uh, setting up procedures and policies. Part of the question is putting them into practice. And that's also part of the larger theme, is that we also know not only what the new policies and procedures ought to be with respect to the police, but also what other issues of importance are in the community in terms of uh, dealing with the history of uh, discrimination uh, that Austin has faced over the years, as has all of Texas. And uh, part of the mission of the Department of Justice, other than just coming in and uh, doing lawsuits or uh, taking the process that they took the last time, was also to try to work things out in relations, and uh, that's what this is about tonight, From uh, to get input from you all, and then uh, tomorrow uh, the city will have the opportunity to do its own uh, dialogue, so we're very grateful, and as Nelson said, even though uh, from my perspective we've been very uh, concerned about what's going on with the police, uh, on a number of levels, one of course is the killings that have gone on that uh, seem totally unjustified, in my view, are, a number of them are totally unjustified. Uh, mental health, mentally ill people uh, being killed. The incident that happened a few months ago is not the first one. Uh, in, and that it results from bad procedures. And then, of course, we had, uh, we've had a number of, uh, <coughs> of people killed. The most recent one has been was Mr. Jackson, uh, showed up at the bank and uh, was dead, uh, shot accidentally. That comes from, I think, uh, a number of issues with respect to the police. Not only uh, they're acting on, uh, illegally, unconstitutionally, contrary to the policies, but we also have the problem that they don't live in the community. They're not part of the community. And uh, we need to figure out how to deal with that. I mean, you know, it's a big difference if you have an officer who lives in, inside the community in terms of understanding the community. But when you come from outside the community, you have a whole different attitude towards Austin any community. You don't see yourself as part of that. You don't see yourself uh, as responding to the, the needs of the community. I mean, you could take the example uh, that we see saw recently of the community policing and cleaning up uh, 12th and Chacon. You know, that's a good example of actually working with the community. Um, but it's a very, unfortunately, very rare example that we see with, with the police. So there, these issues, I think, are are deeper and more profound than just the exercise of uh, killing that we see the police doing. This is, a, unfortunately, I think, a manifestation. So that's what I'm uh, imparting uh, from my perspective and the folks that I represent. But I also I respect that we have a larger uh, calendar here, larger agenda. I'm very uh, happy to introduce uh, Riata Forte from Dallas, from the Department of Justice Office up there. Uh, has come down here to try to work through uh, some of our issues, and uh, I look forward to, uh, we all look forward to the input of all of you tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, as he said, my name is Rietta Forte with the Department of Justice Community Relations Service, and um, what we do is we're a community, we only have a component. We do not investigate, and we do not have enforcement authority. We are community relations where, as he said, we come in when there are conflicts in communities based on race, color, national origin, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, or disability. So I, was, I can't speak on other agencies. The Department of Justice has like 64 different agencies, um, but mine deal with the, that jurisdiction of community conflict. We come in, we bring parties together, sit down, party leaders with the leaders, 
this is part of it, which is a facilitation, facilitate the dialogue so community members can come out and express their issues and concerns on various things, be it law enforcement, uh, it could be sidewalks, just whatever you have concerns, and then I prioritize, prioritize those and you know meet with the city officials or whoever and express the concern. So, like I said, this is a forum for the people. I thank um, Jim Harrington and um, Nelson Linder with the NAACP for inviting us. But I just want to be clear on the get go. Like I said, we, we do not do investigations. So we can hear the concerns and take them back to the leaders and work with them on best practices or ways to resolve conflicts in community. So, with that being said, now we'll, we'll open up the forum and it's for you guys to express your issues and concerns. And I'll take them. concern is, uh, I'm going to start off uh, by reading off the names, 22 people, 23 actually that I have compiled of people that have been murdered, unarmed, by the Austin Police Department. We have Herbert Babelay, Sophia King, Michael Clark, Daniel Rocha, Fidel Macedo, Kevin Brown, Adam Mondragon, Nathaniel Sanders, Devin Contreras, Pat Faye, Howard Yuna, Maurice Pierce, Byron Carter, Sir Leslie Hall, Gilberto Vallejo, Ahmed Bradley, Maurice Caladino, Larry Jackson, Brandon Ben, John Schaefer, Malcolm Smith, Milton Davis, and Jesse Lee Owens. And our problem our concern is, is that there was an investigation by the DOJ and nothing ever came of it. And we would like, I know you said you don't have the power to, call, to actually make an investigation, but we would like you, if you're going to go talk to the city leaders after this, we would, we would like for them to call for another investigation. And... Uh, Like some of the, we would like to figure out how come none of these officers, there's 23 people who have been killed, not one officer has been brought to trial, and I don't, I don't know of one officer that has been indicted by the grand jury here in Travis County. And that's a big concern for us. We're seeing that there's no accountability, and the office of the police monitor is not doing the proper investigation at all. Actually, the, the, the head of the police monitor is an ex-Travis uh, County Sheriff. And we're not seeing any accountability. We're not seeing any officers indicted. We haven't yet seen one of these go to trial. The civil cases that have gone to civil trial have <coughs> been defeated. And we're just, basically, we're fed up with the status quo of people telling us that, that there's going to be an investigation and that things are going to happen and nothing happens. And we were not satisfied with the DOJ's investigation and their recommendations because every recommendation that they've made has not been enforced, has not come into play. The ones that have come into play have been openly violated. Uh, the one where they're not supposed to shoot at people charging in cars. The day that that came out, yep. the day that that ruling came out, uh, they shot somebody in the car. And it hasn't been enough. The civil suits haven't been enough. And the DOJ investigation was inadequate. And we want another civil rights investigation, but we want, we want these officers indicted. And let the cases go to trial. We have not yet seen one case that has gone to trial. Out of all the times that, uh, out of these 23 people that I've just mentioned, not one case has been brought to a criminal trial. There's been a few that have been brought to under civil trials, but none have been brought to a criminal trial. And not one officer has been, has been ever been in trouble for shooting unarmed people. The majority of these people were unarmed, and the majority of these people were shot in the back. And that's, there should be no reason 
why officers are shooting unarmed people. doesn't matter if they run. doesn't matter what they do. An unarmed man should not end up dead and be shot in the back of the head or in the, in the back in, on several occasions. And we're just tired of, of the, the same old, same old people placating to the officers, asking them to do a fair investigation when they've never done a fair investigation. We're, we want our Acevedo fired. And we want any of the city managers or any, anybody who's in the city hall, who's not, including the city manager, who hasn't been, in my eyes, hasn't been doing his job. And it's not, we want a, we want a third party investigation because we cannot trust the Austin Police Department to investigate their own crimes. And, I, and I'm going to share this list with you later. If, if you could look, this is 23 people. We want, we want these, each one of these. The most recent are important, but each one of these is important because each one of these people, several of these people are, are members of this police officer community, but several of these people, nothing has ever been done about their case. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let somebody else speak, but that's what my point is. Go ahead, sir. <coughs> when it comes to the police monitor, that I, don't, I believe they don't have subpoena power, and so like, I think there are things that we can do to make that institution have more teeth, but like, it's kind of designed not to be able to do much. Now, what I'm confused about is you're, like, you're here to listen to our concerns, to take back to our city leaders, but our city leaders ask you, the Department of Justice, to investigate our police force. So well, I don't um, see where this is going. There's, like I said, there's several components or departments in the Department of Justice, so that was a separate investigative body. Like the investigative body is the FBI, the prosecutorial body of the Department of Justice is like the United States Attorney Office. We're just one component, and we're a community relations, so... They ask for all the systems. So, you know, that's, yeah, and that's why I'm like, so I can't speak for that agency or what they, where they're at or what they're doing right now. But this is also part of the process to let the people, you know, to, for me to come out and hear the issues and concerns and to do the things that we do under our mandate, which is, like I said, conflict resolution, training, mediation, and facilitating town halls. So that if there's any other issues other than law enforcement, it can be uh, I wanted to also add, um, I believe you all said that the DOJ said that they weren't going to investigate because APD had done things to follow the over 150 recommendations that they gave. So I'd be really curious to know what were those recommendations that they've done now that <coughs> got them off the hook. If you could get that information to the public, I'm sure we'd appreciate that. And I also want to add, I know what I respect you, Jim, and the, the, the work that your group does, but I don't think the, the problem is bad training. I think these officers are racist, and I, I think when I think the problem needs to be framed in that way. I think when we frame the problem as bad training, we're missing the point of what's going on. My name is Ora Houston, and I've lived in this community for an extremely long time. And um, there. This is a very complex issue and one that um, I think at the heart of it is systemic racism. Uh, no one wants to talk about the fact that Austin is, has some systemic institutional racist practices and procedures. Um, they don't want to deal with it. Um, and um, I may disagree with many people here about the, the Chief Acevedo uh, uh, because I've lived through Chief Me and the chief before him, and they didn't even come out. When something really bad happened in our community, Chief Me never left his office. He never came, except for December the 15th when the 15-year-old girl was killed. That's the only time he ever came out. So Chief Acevedo is trying to engage in the community, and so I and, and trying to make sure that the officers are um, um, held accountable maybe not the way we would like to see them held accountable because I too would like to see a true bill on one of them and they go to trial. But they, some people, they do get fired eventually. So my, my concern is why does the police um, union have so much power in this city so that they can stop the police monitor's records from being uh, shared with the public, which means that we don't get but part of the truth. We get the truth that they tell us. We don't know what the police monitor's records show because we never get that. And that's because the police union is so 
strong. So what, what's the problem with that? Why is that a, an issue? And then the other thing, as someone said, is the lack of people living in the community. 65% um, of our offices live outside of Austin. They live in Lockhart and Hayes County and Buda and Gerald, some of them. And those are different kinds of communities uh, where you have communities of interest and communities of different age, uh, ethnic and cultural groups. And so while I think they try to do a cultural sensitivity training, um, I'm not sure that works when you don't live here. You pay your taxes someplace else, you get paid by us. But you live someplace else, and so that's your community of interest, not Austin. So I need to have uh, understanding about why is it. They're going to say it's because of lack of affordable housing, but that's the city's problem. That's not our problem, because we all are having that problem. But we need to know why they have so many police officers that live outside of this jurisdiction. department and everybody criminalizing our children from school age. They start with them in the school age and then when they get up to teenagers and they make a mistake or something or something happens, then they want to holler, well they already have a, a juvenile record. They get <coughs> juvenile records for just little altercations at school. <laughs> and I, there should be some other way that they can handle that. I mean, School's been around for a long time, and there's a lot of us here that got in trouble when we were in elementary school. We didn't get a record because of it, but that's starting our kids out early being criminalized. And then that gives them a reason to say, okay, well, this one had problems when he was in school. You know, assaulting people, you know, cursing, late for school all the time. You know, just, and some of it is behavioral, some of it is mental. You don't know what's going on. They don't even try to find out. They just automatically stamp you, criminalize you, throw you in the base. And then as you grow up, that follows you. So every time something goes on, they want to holler, that one did it. That one is known for doing this. This one is known for doing that. And it might not even be there. But because they're criminals, they got, got a little record. They want to treat them like criminals. And then when they, when they grow up, that's the way they act. Then when the police pull them over, when they're grown, they want to know why they're so nervous. You must be doing something wrong. It's not that they're doing something wrong. It's, you done killed so many of us already that were unarmed at a traffic stop, you know, or something sim simple like that, and we end up dead, you know? So they, they got a reason to be scared, nervous, to intimidate it, and that's what's going on. And now they're, and now they're ending up dead, and they're saying, oh, it's a suspicious behavior. Mm. They felt threatened. But see, if you feel threatened that you're gonna that they're gonna shoot you or something's gonna happen bad, you're gonna be nervous. But that's my that's my problem that I have. Well, my problem is also with children. I work with a lot of children, do a lot of volunteer, and like she says, I mean, from sixth grade they start getting criminal records and. And there's also stuff, there's little convenience stores they're selling that could product, you know. That's what gets them paranoid, makes them run from the law, and, you know, that's, I don't know why our city is letting these little convenience stores sell this so-called Kush, whatever it's called. What is it? Kush. Uh, we don't know what, uh, they call it sometimes synthetic marijuana, whatever it is. That stuff makes them hallucinate, they run. Of course, when they run, they're going to run when they see a policeman. I mean, and that's how they start getting their records, you know, and, and also with our Vietnam vets, you know, where else affordable housing? They sleep under the bridge, they get arrested for sleeping under the bridge. Where else are they going to sleep? And the city and the city council have to, you know, be liable for that. Cause those are you know, Vietnam vets that served our country and fought for our country. And that's not fair for them to get treated like that. <coughs> Thank you, man. Um, my name is Richard Franklin. I uh, have some issues with the fact that the city gets millions of dollars every year uh, organizations and agencies to help 
the underserved population of the city. And for some odd reason, that money never goes to minorities to help to do those services. Uh, when we do get the money, it's, it's dimes compared to dollars. Um, for example, two years ago, they set aside supposedly $33 million was, was flowing down from the, from the federal government um, for, uh, to help, again, the underserved populations, especially kids and uh, youth services, et cetera. And out of that $11 million per year, it was going to be three years, I went back and looked at and asked them for Freedom of Open, uh, Freedom Information Act. Uh, where that money went, there was only one minority organization that received any money out of that initial money. The city then went back and found another half a million dollars to put out. Out of that half a million dollars, 367000 of it was already uh, was already tailored to an organization, again, not a minority organization, to help the underserved population. And they gave out four uh, $33,000 um, contracts for other organizations. And out of those four, uh, two of them were mi minorities for $33,000. The same year, the Michael Lofton Group went downtown, uh, uh, Harvest Foundation, and had to beg for $160,000 uh, offline and not part of the process, and had to ha and literally had to go to the city hall and, and would hat in hand and beg for that money. Uh, I've gone and talked to them directly with the organization I've, I've been working with for over seven years now, extremely successful in helping kids understand the importance of education uh, and getting them on the right track. I've done this for over 700 kids in the last seven years uh, for very little money. Uh, when I went to the city and said, look, I, I've got this project which is actually going to turn around some situations and get kids to become entrepreneurs and create things in the community for themselves, which would then be self-perpetuating, which is something they don't want to have happen, by the way. At least that's what it appears to me. They don't want businesses started by these kids. They don't want people out here doing well for themselves. They want them subservient. They want them always dependent on the city for, for services rather than creating for themselves. That's not what this program was dy designed to do. I was told by the city manager, uh, I don't want to look like I'm doing too many black programs. <laughs> um, I'm concerned that I, I then heard from someone else later on that it wasn't that they didn't like the program, it's just that I didn't have any numbers to prove what I was saying. None of the other people out here are proving a damn thing at, at any point in time. We've got low-income housing issues all around the state, all around the city, all around the county. You've got unemployment at 33% at in the outlying areas. You've got any number of issues that are affecting the community out here that these organizations are supposed to be helping, and yet no one turns in any numbers at the end of the day and says, I've done anything to change it. And the numbers come, you keep coming back every year negatively with respect to that. So the problem I'm having right now is money is given to organizations over and over and over again. We asked for, for accounting of $55 million for the bond issue uh, for low-income housing six years ago. That money still has not been accounted for properly. And now they've come back and said, well, we're going to do some more low-income housing and go back and find out the low-income housing they're talking about has nothing to do with low-income people. It's a 67% of the 60% of, of, of the mean income. Well, the mean, in, uh, the mean income in Austin, the mean income in Austin is uh, $48,000 when you talk about that at that, that level. Well, that's not what the African-American Latino population makes. We're at thirty-three and $34,000 a year for a family of four. So we can't afford even the low-income housing they're talking about developing. So at the end of the day, we need to start looking at all of these systems, all of these organizations that they're, they're set up, and all this money that's flowing down is supposed to be helping, and why the outcomes aren't more positive toward helping the people they said are going to be helping. You've got organizations that are set up right now that are supposed to be the ones who conduit money to us. Well, if you've got federal money flowing down and it's then given to big and people fund and all these other organizations who then require us to have collateral to get, to get money to go out and start a business, we then go back and say, well, the problem we have is we don't have the credit to get it in the first place. We don't have the collateral. We need some faith. That's why you sent the money down here. We need some faith. We need some money d d directly dedicated to the community out here, dedicated to people who are actually doing the work at the ground level. And that's not happening. I got the, I got the, the numbers to show you. I said, here's, here's the numbers. Here's how, here's how it can be done. But at the end of the day, they don't have the outcomes tied to anything that's positive in changing the outcomes of the community. It just isn't that way. It doesn't happen until they decide that's what they want to have happen in those areas. And suddenly you look up and, oh, the roads are fixed. The infrastructure is there for someone else. We were there for 10 years, 20 years, and yet that never happened.
But when you go out here now, suddenly if you decide, if they decide that's where the next uh, group is going to be moving into, the roads are fixed. Everything's fine. So it's a it's a, a, a myriad of issues that need to be addressed from the standpoint of what needs to make the, the, the community better. Because when you start talking about unemployment in the community right now, African Americans and Latino youth are at over 33%. I had kids who graduated from school this year in my program call me up the next day and say, Mr. Franklin, I graduated. I did what they told me to do. Ain't no jobs. Ain't no jobs. And they, can't, and, they, and they haven't learned how to create something for themselves. So if we think that we're going to send a kid out here and put him on a McJob and he can survive in, in Austin, that ain't happening. They might as well go back out in the streets and do what, they normally, what they've been accustomed to doing, trying to make as much money, as quick money as they can. Because McJob doesn't pay the bills in Austin.
people that are being hired are people that are friends to the friend of a friend or someone who has dated or wanted to date or couldn't date. But how do people that don't have that connection on the inside get hired? We had a situation at the Dorothy Turner Velma Roberts Recreation Center. If you're anybody in Austin, if you know anything, you know that they were two civil rights proponents. We had two black men that worked at that recreation center. We stated very clearly to Parks and Rec when we heard that they were wanting to move them that it would be detrimental to the young men in that area if they moved them. I had the program manager who happens to be uh, from Guatemala, I believe, uh, looked me in the face and told me she understood and moved them. But while her brother, who worked at Hancock Recreation Center, who is not supposed to work under a relative, that's a, that's a city rule, was still on the payroll at Hancock Recreation Center until we brought it to Chief McDonald's knowledge that this boy was this girl's uh, relative. So there's, they, there's a disparity in hiring in most city departments. When I mention it to people that have worked for the city or the state, they tell me, if you don't know somebody, you're not getting hired. So you can't expect black people and, and Hispanics and some other groups that have come into Austin to be able to take care of their families because they can't get hired, even if they're qualified. You cannot tell me that a young man that has less than 50 hours of college should be hired over a young man that has done PhD work. And then one of the people who sat in on the interview said that the young black man that did PhD work was not articulate. Mm. We have all of those records too. So I have a problem. I have a big problem with parks and recreation. And when we discuss it with them, we're going to fix it. We're going to. I promise you, we're going to fix it. Mm. And nothing is ever fixed. Young lady, right there, have a hand. Yes. Community Relations Service, and as I explained to them earlier, we are a component of the Department of Justice responsible for um, helping communities when there's tension based on race, color, national origin, gender, gender identity, religion, or disability. Basically, with conflict resolution, this is you know form, and so we do facilitate you know facilitating this dialogue where we have mediation services, training, and consultation. Um, we're a neutral third party, so we're not only you we know, don't take sides but we're not the investigative body or enforcement, so. Okay. In that case, how can I get someone who I can present my documents and evidence of discrimination against myself and my family? It's just two of us. It's not 20 of us. It's me and him. But I'm Mexican. He is black. And we're both very proud. Um, I call him my little Aztec warrior. He ended up play on African-American and Aztec is my heritage. Um, you know, these, these write-offs on Riverside for the condominiums that are saying, hey, affordable housing, give us a million dollars off the, already what we're going to pay, we're investing 10%, we're investing, you know, millions in your city, and this is where we want to be, and God and break us off a discount, I don't understand that, well ma'am, I'm homeless since yesterday, I don't mean to put my business out there, y'all, but I'm unemployed since August 16th, laid off, my, my position went away, I'm not underqualified, I can speak just almost about seven languages, my child is trilingual, thanks be to God, we don't practice American Sign Language daily, but I can give you some sign language. I'm not sure you can understand what I'm trying to communicate, especially to APD. The APD will come and ask me, what hurts, what kind of medicine do you take? Why are you being paranoid? Excuse me, APD, that's HIPAA protected, Health Information Privacy Protection Act. It's a law, y'all. And the irrelevance to the matter is someone is coming through my child's window. There's fingerprints, and the man told me, I'm not, you're just being paranoid, and I'm APD, and I'm not writing no report, and Quit acting like that. And I'm like, wait a minute, Tara. You know, when your heart's not right and someone really blesses you, 
you don't understand, because I said to him, Officer, may your daughter never have a father that comes home to have his child, female child, window screen to tamper with. The man told me I've been hating you 30 years, and I ain't never seen no criminal take a screen off the house and put it back on. I live in uh, housing, uh, HUD, whatever it is, you know, I have vouchers. They cannot get into the condos on Riverside, and I don't cross with them, because nobody now can even see Lady Bird Lake, and it looks like a river. So I used to could look at it, but I can't anymore because I can't get no demons. Did I mention I'm homeless? Okay. So I've got all of this going on. I'm trying to show my son that APD is not something to be afraid of, but we can't call them because they won't come to our address. I asked my apartment complex manager, uh, Rosemont of William Sioux Creek, sir, will you please let me out of my lease because I'm afraid for the safety of myself and my family. They said, sure, no problem. We won't scratch your credit. We won't charge you extra. You can go because they're pulling guns on my neighbors. Not in building one, not in building eight, in my building, in my breezeway. The apartment complex cannot tell us about that because that manager as well uh, favor, uh, is practices nepotism. I think that's what they call it when they say I'm going to hire my nephew and my niece. And the lady has six sons. On Christmas, someone came through one of our tenant stores with a key, ma'am, with an office key. Came into their home. It was a mother and a father and children sleeping inside of the Christmas tree. Okay? She called the manager. The manager didn't have nothing to say. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay? The manager today was visited by the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. They have a once every three year audit. God is good. I was there the first time. I didn't think the manager would be, but she had got kicked out of her office because they told her, unlock all your doors. I'm here to look. She didn't know what to do. She sure let, she sure enough let me on my lease, and she sure up is gonna tax me up on my whatever I owe because I have a puppy and a child. You know. So my problem and my hamster just reminded me. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Son. I gotta wrap it up. So, ma'am, I need to have some kind of case manager look at my different documents of evidence where I have called APD so many times, ma'am, they put me in a queue. You know what a queue is? It's spelled Q-U-E-U-E. -U -E. You fall off after a while. If you don't keep calling them, they call you and say, you didn't answer, so we did not leave a voicemail. Excuse me? I've been at Burger King till 11 o'clock. Did you know Burger King closed? They do, even the one with the playground. At 11 o'clock, I said, y'all, I'm waiting on APD. They said, we know that. There they are. I'm like, oh, okay, well. <laughs> Let me get out. <laughs> so I went and talked with them. They're like, you know, yeah, my grandma just died too. We all got problems. Boom. Go home. Okay, this is the 45th fifth time. I have filed freedom of information requests through McLennan County and been denied. My apartment manager that I said, please, can you, since I'm, since y'all letting me go on safety issues, can you print me out the last 90 days of what happened at 4509 East St. Elmo Road? He said, yeah, sure. I pull it up right now. I said, okay. Then the phone rang and we all got busy. And he said, here it goes right here. I'm going to print it out. Well, when I came back the next day, he had failed to print it out. And then for some reason, he couldn't maneuver the map onto whichever address that he needed to get my print out. Okay? It's not conspiracy, ma'am. It's electronics. But it's something wrong. Because that's not, how can you, I wish you would go onto a laptop right now and go to that address and see how many incidents. It's odd that you got to go on there and click. How many kidnappings been here? How many rapes been here? How many robberies been here? How many thefts? And you got to go one page by one page, and now it's locked. My apartment complex manager cannot even print the screen. And I'm so gone out of there that I'm homeless. Okay? It's a safety reason. If somebody comes through my window, I have to kill them. I have to defend myself out. I got to go to trial. My baby goes to the state, and it's not fair. In 10 years, APD will shoot my child. It is next. Yeah. But right now, they won't come and help me stop people. Places I've been weeks trying to call somebody to come help me. I pay taxes. I've worked since I'm 15. I've always had my own place, my own car, and I don't need no help from nobody. Not the attorney general. I live on his block. That's St. Elmo Road. They're not helping. You know, uh, the father contempts the court order for child support. Hey, if I don't tell them where this baby is at, I got a problem. But if he don't tell them where he's at, I just get to go home. <laughs> You know, I'm like, wait a minute, but I've been at this for six months calling y'all, follow-up calling y'all, asking y'all, requesting y'all enforcement. You know what I mean? And it's, man, I went to the Capitol. I was there for 17 hours trying to vote against the HB2. I got a parking meter ticket from a state of Texas DPS officer down on Congress. Not at the Capitol, because they don't have no disabled parking at the Capitol. It's over there around in the back somewhere. There's no access ramps at the Capitol. The, 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 we 
wheelchairs don't have electricity up on them because guess what? I'm feet disabled. I asked for a wheelchair. Rick Perry got two mansions, but we ain't got no electricity in the chair. I got stuck on the, in the basement because I couldn't get through the doors. I had two football-sized men come and try to unlatch the door. I would have burnt down in the building. I was stuck. And that's not correct. I got, so I still got an outstanding parking citation from DPS down on Congress Avenue, which is the city of Austin. And they got meter maids all day. They wear a white shirt, black pants. They got their little hand thing on the side so nobody see them right getting rolled up. Um, I've been to City Hall. I've been VIP escorted out twice. <laughs> see, I call it VIP escort. The man had a gun. He said, come this way. I said, well, can I follow you? Because I get nervous. He said, yeah, there's a lot of people moving in the same direction. APD came up there to me in City Hall to inquire about my medical status, man. That's against HIPAA. I've worked at hospitals. I've worked at IRS. I've worked at DPS. And I'm tired of getting handled. I've been brown my whole life. My whole life. And I don't like being handled. And when I handle people back, it's a problem. They call me paranoid. They call me whatever it's got to be for them to shoot me. They came to my house that day, Officer Ebert, E-I-B-E-R-T-A-P-D. The one that told me he's been on 30 years and he's not going to write me no report and he's not going to, he said, they're going to throw the screens away because my management probably broke them when they were attaching them to the building because they're cheap. I have them in my storage because did I tell you I'm homeless? I'm, I'm going crazy, ma'am, and it's not right what's going on. I have a housing voucher, ma'am. They won't take it at the condo. I don't have a record, but I've been charged, and that's enough. That's enough. Like the young other young lady, mom, I, I, I see her as a mother. I see her kind of in my position. <sighs> Lord have mercy. I did something dumb. I didn't pay a ticket when I was 19, and then I said I was my sister with my ID in the car. That's crazy. But now I have this some kind of charge about a fugitive on my record, and it's a problem. There's no conviction. There's no conviction. You know, so it makes it hard for me to get work. I got to carry around my court documents about where it's been dismissed and how the district not what it looks like, and X, Y, and Z, right? So I got a lot of problems. Safety. Sheriff's Department uh, out on Brown Lane, 9608 Brown Lane in July, gave me a criminal trespass citation because I came over there to get property that belonged to me. They tried it. So I came back next time. I called this best person. Like, I had to disruption in the detail. Call the police to go over there and get your property. Police said, we're not, uh, we're not, we don't go that far. That's not APD, that's Sheriff. So sheriff, now the sheriff came and they gave me a criminal trespass and I told them they tried to try me, you know? They said, well, you need to just go away from here because we're not immigration police, we're not child labor police, we're not IRS police. You need to get away from here. And I was like, why? And they gave me a criminal trespass citation when I had an appointment with the owner to be there at that designated time for that designated purpose. That's outstanding. It seems like every time I try to exert my position, man, This is my prerogative. And I'm trying so hard. He's got a Bible. We love Jesus. He goes to a preparatory school where they're going to teach him violin for free. Let me find out. KBCI is a good place. I listen to them every morning. I call in and I try to help my community and tell them, y'all can get these surcharges dismissed. If you're on SNAP, get your license back. They don't announce that. They don't announce these kind of things. Why? And I need, like, the caseworker to help me with all of my, I've got documents. some insight to, to what you're hearing, give me some feedback on what's going to happen with this complaint that I filed. It's a verbal complaint. That's another problem. It always has to be written. <laughs> I'm Richard Boland. Uh, I'll talk first about the Austin Police Department. People that are my age or older remember in the late 70s in Atlanta there was a serial killer running around killing young black men. At the time, it was terrible. You know, they arrested Wayne Williams for it. There's even some question whether they got the right guy even back then. But, you know, but by the standards of 1979, it was terrible because he was killing one or two young black men a year. It even took a while to notice that, hey, there's a pattern here. You know, and they went back and looked and all the killings were the same. It was slow enough that it took that long. So suppose we got Wayne Williams out of jail and made him the, Austin, the chief of the Austin police. What would happen here? 
one or two young black men killed every year. Yeah. With Art Acevedo, throw in a few white people. Throw in a Vietnamese guy. And as far as I know, Wayne Williams wasn't one of those sickos that liked to kill dogs, too. You know, we have a serial killer in Austin. It's called the Austin Police Department. Art Acevedo is allegedly in charge of the Austin Police Department. He allegedly gives the orders. Allegedly nothing happens you know, without his consent. So either he's consenting to this, fully responsible for serial killing, or else he's not in charge of the Austin Police Department, and why on earth are we paying him $200,000 a year if he's not running the Austin Police Department? Either way, he needs to be out of here. That's my feeling about the Austin Police Department. The Justice Department, I understand it's not your branch. <laughs> they investigated the Austin Police Department's policies and procedures. The policies and procedures aren't so bad, but even like Abel says, they pass the procedure against jumping out in front of cars and shooting in it. Well, the next day they jump out in front of a car and shoot in it and kill someone. They pass a procedure where if they deal with a mentally ill person, they have to have you know, mental, professional mental health people with them. Shortly after that, Herbert Babelay shot dead. You know, they have a procedure that they have somebody that you know, is non-cooperative, has a gun. They're supposed to call SWAT. Actually, our SWAT team in Austin is pretty good at bringing people out alive. You know, they may de deny everybody their rights for a three-block radius to come and go while they're there. But actually, our SWAT team in Austin doesn't kill a lot of people, and that's one thing I won't criticize the Austin Police Department about. But I will criticize them for not calling when they should. You know, if Mr. Jackson ran under a bridge, they could have called SWAT. They could have just called the backup. Yeah, that's all, you know, that's all they needed. Art Acevedo himself didn't follow policies. If you saw on the news where allegedly he was assaulted by a homeless person, that assault was an open-handed shove, according to the news reports. And it didn't say anything, but it showed his mug shot, and the guy had a big bleeding cut on his forehead. But he assaulted Art Acevedo. And they have policies for how to wake up a homeless person. I don't know if you all remember, there's an officer, Gary Griffin, just beat the living crap out of a homeless person several years ago. You know, the, the previous chief, Chief Watson, fired him. The police union and their arbitrators gave him his job back. Art Acevedo provo promoted this guy to district representative. He's in charge of basically the homeless people downtown. A guy who just brutally beat a guy several years ago, cost the city a nice lawsuit. Anyway, if you can talk to the investigation branch, the FBI, ask them to investigate the dead bodies, not the policies and procedures. Investigate the killings. That's what's happening. Uh, I also have a complaint about the district attorney's office. And it's hard to prove because grand jury proceedings are secret. But Rosemary Lindbergh can get a indictment on a ham sandwich unless that ham sandwich has an Austin Police Department badge pinned to it. Then she becomes a terrible lawyer. She just can't get an indictment, no matter how hard she apparently tries. I'd really like to see Mr. Cl Officer Kleinert's case prosecuted by a special prosecutor. Uh, I'd be happy to let uh, Adam Lowy, the civil lawyer that's doing it, let him do a private prosecution, which is allowed under the law if he's willing to. You know, I realize that either your family's going to have to pay him, which may be out of the question, or maybe we can get him to realize that he's a lot more likely to win a lawsuit if he's already won a murder conviction against him. Yeah, if we can get Adam to do that, he'd be a better prosecutor than Rosemary Lindbergh any day. I'd trust him over her any day. And I'd trust a special prosecutor over her. We need to get her away from prosecuting Austin Police. The police union contributes too much to her re-election. The Austin Police Department just never was able to catch her driving drunk, and she can never get a, an indictment against an Austin Police officer. You, and last, well, I wanted to say something. My friend, Mr. Linder, did he leave? He leave. Right <laughs> I remember when Nathaniel Sanders was killed. Mr. Linder was a man on fire. He was going after the city. He called Mayor Leffingwell a snake in the grass. I remember that. Hi, Mr. Linder. I was just speaking of you. And I mean this to be a constructive criticism. 
when Nathaniel, when Nathaniel Sanders was killed, I remember you were the man on fire, like Denzel. You were going to get them all. You spoke out against Mayor Leff Leffingwell. I remember you called him a snake in the grass. I remember you said Chris Riley was more interested in bicycles than minorities. I know you called out people that were on the council then. You were awesome. Now, I hope I didn't misunderstand you at this previous community meeting. You wanted us to wait and see what the city does to cooperate with the officials. It's past time for cooperation. You know, if not now, when? We've waited long enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to criticize my own previous political party, the one that I believed in for a long time, the one that was supposed to help poor people. I was delegate to county conventions. I was very loyal for a long time. I still believe in a lot of the stuff that they say they believe in. But we have a, a minority Democrat president. We have a minority Democrat attorney general. We have a city council made of all Democrats. We have a city manager who's a black Democrat. We have a chief of police who's a Hispanic Democrat. And they're still killing black people and a few white people and a lot of dogs with impunity. And I don't mean just not punishment. They get a paid vacation. They can be on the beach drinking margaritas after they kill somebody. It is that bad. It's that disgusting. Yeah. I wish Chief Acevedo would have come so I could have called him a serial killer to his face because that's how much respect I lack for him. Now shut up. Thank you. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to add to Richard's comment. Uh, If you are here to deal with the community relations, we, everybody here, would like to know what are you going to do next to make things better for us? What recommendations are you going to take to the city council? And to Mr. Linder and Civil Her Rights. Harrington. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Harrington. Mr. Harrington. <laughs> uh, we're not satisfied with the rhetoric that, especially standing next to the Art Acevedo in these press conferences, we're not really satisfied. We want you openly to go to city council and denounce these people for what it is. Mm -hmm. If you can't <laughs> speak plain for what we call murder, what murder is, uh, we, need, we need you to be a little bit more forceful because we don't have the position to go to city council all the time. We don't have the position to speak with Art Acevedo. We don't have the power to file lawsuits. We're just people. And we want you, we want y'all to, to make it clear to Art Acevedo that we're tired of his officers murdering unarmed people and not being held accountable for it. It's, it's high time that after I sat off, if, if any of y'all missed this, you weren't here when I first started, I counted off 23 people who have been murdered by Austin police officers, many of them unarmed, and many of them shot in the back. The civil rights lawsuits aren't working, because every civil rights lawsuit that pretty much that they've had goes to federal court and gets thrown out, or gets beat. Money, and they have enough money to pay off any lawsuit that we file against them. We don't want money. We don't want somebody to come out to speak with us that has no power to do anything. We want somebody to come out to speak to us that's going to be able to restart an investigation, call for a special prosecutor, and actually have some of these people brought up on murder charges. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. And the time for, in my eyes, the time for let them do the investigation, they'll, they'll work it all out in time. That's not good enough for us anymore. The Department of Justice investigation was inadequate because it only investigated the policies. It didn't investigate the actual murders that were that have been committed. And I was I was just going along with what Richard said. I don't, me personally, I don't believe Art Acevedo has done anything to to rein in these officers. I don't think personally. But I'm going to go ahead and pass the floor.
seven years of the types of abuse that goes on, the kidnapping, the theft, um, beating, sleeping people, sleeping's not a crime. Um, if the police believe sleeping's a crime, maybe we'll start arresting sleeping police officers to sleep in their cars all night and take the <laughs> um, which we have documentation of. You only have to really talk to the community, and especially the poor in the community, the socioeconomic uh, disadvantage in the community, uh, minorities, When I talked to the DOJ, and um, I was one of 10 people invited by the ACLU in 2006 to, um, to give testimony uh, against the Austin Police's uh, abuse, the Department of Justice um, investigator Jeremiah and the other investigators that are downtown on Congress, well, that's where the DOJ office is, and we all need to be aware of that. When we bring someone in from down, out of town, we have a DOJ office right here. I don't understand what they're doing here if they're not going to investigate. Um, they need to bring people to staff that office, and we need some we don't, need, we don't need to spend taxes on the department without justice. We need justice. Um, uh, many people have given their stories, and, um, and I'm not going to give you mine because mine can be whipped up easily. There's plenty of news on it. Um, when someone or something is unarmed and shot by a, by a warrior cop, and there's no accountability, no transparency, and then we have a lying police chief who, if you look at the record, he said he's going to have accountability. He said he's going to have transparency. He never does. He always says that the uh, actions of his police officers are justified. He's never fired a single officer for the use of force, only for um, picking up hookers, for movie tickets, for things that are irrelevant to what the people care about. People want protection. That's what we pay millions and millions and millions of dollars for, is to be protected from the, by the Austin police officers. But right now, we need protection from, from the police officers. We basically need something like um, uh, some, some kind of stopgap because every every day, every week, every month, there's another abuse of power, another person shot, arrested, kidnapped, beaten, that we don't hear about. We're only talking on your list, Abel. There's probably 10 <coughs> with dog shootings that I've been investigating. There's dozens of dogs that they won't tell us about. When I had to call them on the last dog from three weeks ago um, that was shot, the open record, the uh, PIO office wouldn't give me any information. They wouldn't tell me if the dog was dead. They uh, wouldn't give us addresses. They said we could file open records requests. Well, I filed a federal, my federal civil liberties attorney has filed open records requests. And any victim that's in Austin will tell you you'll never hear a single reply from the city of Austin's uh, open records department. So that means the Office of the Personnel Man on the Office of Police Monitor is a joke. It's, it's a stopgap so the city doesn't have to respond directly with internal affairs and investigate their police officers. The, the Austin uh, Police Department and Mark Ott have hired a politician and not a police chief, and he's flat out lies and does um, psyop type speaking, double speak to us, telling us that, that it's a justified accident and things like that. When it's clearly a man's hand, anybody with reason knows that any of us can't walk around with our gun on it, our gun out in the, in the back of somebody's head with our finger on the trigger. There, that's not an accident. That's called manslaughter. Accident's a lie. That's a lying word. And we don't. We deserve more respect to, than that. As a victim, they lied to me about the number of to times that my dog was shot as he was running away from him, crying for his life. They, they, they dishonored themselves and me, and they further traumatized me by lying. All the victims that have to put up with the lies and, and BS from the Office of uh, Police Monitor and from Acevedo and, and Assistant Chief Beaton, and then the DA and... Um, and whatever kind of um, external forces come out and say everything's okay, let's let them just investigate themselves. That further traumatizes a victim. It further makes us feel like we're, we're not able to um, get a fair shake. And when we, don't, when we don't know justice, we don't know peace, then something else will happen. And we all know what's happening across America. We're trying to do something where we live in Austin. We're trying to make this place better. And we definitely don't want people from outside the town shooting us, going back to their homes and not having to shop for groceries here in the town. People that are from outside of our community just don't feel for us like, like they should. And uh, this good old boy network of hiring your buddies and, you know, just whoever you want to hire and do all that, that's not fair. And we know that that's been a problem in government at all levels for a long time. Um, 
So basically, we want we want the truth. We want someone to get to the bottom of it. We want the the, the DOJ to investigate. We want them to staff that office. To, or I want them to staff the office right downtown. I've been in the office. Uh, I know it's here. So I don't know why we don't have an investigative office right there. Since we obviously have had, you know, how many years? 10, 20 years of murder in this city and oppression. And it's not going to end. It's not going to get better just because we say, oh, we got a new chief, or oh, we did this, we did this new policy. It's going to get better when the people stand up. And that's what all of us are doing. And, and every, every murder that we have just escalates this thing another step. And I'm trying to de-escalate it. And I need some cooperation from the police department and the city leaders. Right now, they're all running scared, hiding and lying. And that's not representative of the type of society that we have in Austin. We have a very open and honest society. We hug each other. We, um, a lot of people even lock their doors of their cars. It's just an open and honest society. And we don't need L.A. here. We don't need Houston here. We don't need the kind of inner city problems and policing that they have everywhere else. This is not a big, giant city. This is still a normal community. And uh, like with this dog, last dog, was shot in their, uh, off North Lamar. All the news made it sound like it was Runberg, like it was like this crime center. It's not. It's a quiet neighborhood with alarm systems and, and nice cars and no, I mean, not that, that, that the socioeconomically deprived aren't nice, but they always try to make it seem like it's poor people's problem. It's not everybody's problem. It's everybody's problem. I know people that are older than me, that are more Anglo than I am, and that have money, that are beaten down by the cops, arrested at Walmart for things they didn't do, profiled because of surcharges, uh, some tickets they didn't even know about. There's all sorts of stuff going on in Austin, and the way it's dealt with is not in a, in a Passionate, caring, and a cooperative manner. Sir, can I talk to you like it used to be? Probably when you were growing up, when my grandparents, when my aunt was growing up, it was different. Now it's, what are you doing? Where are you going? And, and let me see your ID. You don't have a ID. You're a criminal. Did you see the Constitution? Get on the ground. I don't want to hear that. You want me to shoot you? It's your word against mine. It's all that. And you can act. I, I can bring people all day long. And that was my problem with the DOJ the first time when I talked to them. They said, we're going to do rider alongs. We're going to talk to 10 people at the ACLU. And then we're going to go do ride-alongs and let the chief and the police just give us a dog and pony show. That's BS. If you really want to know what's going on, you got to get people on the street. you got to put up cameras on, on people. you got to start reporting and talking to people that have actually had actual victims and talk to their story. I mean, get their, get their story because you're not going to get the truth from the police department trying to protect itself from change. Change costs money. And change is not what the government usually wants to do quickly. And the people want something quickly done. Because frankly, it's just... We're at a, I think we're at a precipice where things are going to start escalating out of control. I personally am suing the, uh, the police chief for negligence on the shooting of my dog because he's ultimately responsible and he gets paid to be responsible. And, um, and so we're, we're going to see more of that. That's going to cost the city a lot of money. People are going to stop being complicit, stop IDing themselves. All of us with, um, with different activist groups are carrying cameras on our cars because that's the only protection we have against getting shot in the back of the head anymore. So, yeah, camera's the only thing we got is accountability because our, our Acevedo promised us accountability and transparency, and he's giving us nothing. So that's, I'm, I'm sorry, I take up too much time. That's what I have to say. <laughs> Let me look at this young lady right here. somebody is not ever an accident. It's murder. And that was wrong. Now I have to be without an uncle. My three cousins have to be without a dad. One of my cousins is special needs. So I don't know what they're going to do because they cry themselves to sleep every single night because of what happened. So we just need justice.
signed the, the petition that we have to get Larry Jackson's murderer, Detective Kleinart, fired. We're taking these petitions to the various commissions and boards that have power or some kind of recommendation power over APD. So that way they can make recommendations to City Hall. So that way they can pressure the city manager to pressure the, the chief off the bid of to fire Kleinart. I think if we actually can, can get one of these officers fired, maybe we can finally put APD on check once they know that, hey, if they kill somebody, we're not going to just let it go. There's going to be a hell of a pay. So if, if you if you if you you've also are tired, if you've also lost faith, please sign our petition and organize with us. Come out with us. We meet every Thursday at the Texas Music Museum, and we want to build a movement for justice so we can stop this stuff. We're more than fired.
stand up right now, but but one thing I want to 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 iterate to everybody, especially to you, to you DOJ. There's a lot of pain in this room. There's a lot of, of upset. There's a lot of slight that is taking place. And this isn't a recent development. This is taking place over years. Not 10 years, not 20 years, more like 30, 40, 50 years. And what has to be understood is, is that people, some people, when they come to Austin, they look at, oh, how pretty Austin is. Oh, they've got this. Oh, they've got that. But you peel that onion back. You peel that onion back, and you look at what East Austin used to be 30, 40 years ago. There were shops here. There were foundries here. There was a mattress factory here. People had places to live, and they could afford their home. People were living in that community, and they had business in that community where they could work, and they could live, and they could afford their homes. Now, you look at who's, look at who's in East Austin now. You've got, you got homes, you've got people who had homes that can't stay in their homes because they've been priced out of them. So they have to move out to places like Manor and Pflugerville and Elgin and, and that sort of thing, and there's no place for them to live. They, they have no place to go. And then, on top of that, you have the situation in which every government entity, there's not spending any money in the minority community. You can look at, at, at you know, any department. As the gentleman said a little while ago, when it was a majority minority community, you couldn't get the street fixed. And now, bingo, streets get fixed. <laughs> so, if DOJ is going to do anything, DOJ needs to look at every department in the city, everything that does business in the city, and peel through all those layers, and it will be very apparent, extremely apparent, of all the disproportionate um, activities that they take place. You know, for instance, um, next year, the city of Austin wants to give um, the people on the west side of town, which, if you're unfamiliar with, which is the more money side of town, they want to give them an urban rail system. Well, that's equivalent to giving somebody else a Lamborghini a Porsche when the people who, who really need the transit system don't have a bicycle. So when you look at situations like that and you look at how historically minority communities have been treated and how money has been spent in minority communities, that is a situation where you need to look at everything. And police action and all that is only a symptom of a bigger problem. The bigger problem is, is a systemic racism which lives in every part of, of the whole situation. You have to deal, if you can't treat cancer with, with, with something that, you know, shot, you have to treat the entire thing. You can't just, you know, if you have um, a systemic cancer, you can't treat a finger, you know, you can't treat, you can't treat a thumb. You have to treat the entire system. So what the DOJ needs to look at is, say for instance, um, where is Capital Metro spending their money? Where is the city of Austin spending their money? Where is the water department spending their money? Why isn't there more minority businesses? Why isn't there more of a set aside minority businesses to do things? Why is the police department killing everybody? You know, all of these things are systemic of a bigger problem. And you have to treat the entire problem. Because if you don't treat the entire problem, then the problem will not go away. You have to do it all. So, since you're here from DOJ, and you want to take something back to the city, and you want to take it back to other people in DOJ, you, what you need to do is to come in here like a force of avenging angels and go through every single department in the city. Because only in that manner, and only in that way, will you uh, truly be able to address the problem. It's not just about money. It's not just about the people. It's about everything that involves and everything that goes into it. And you young man, there are so many things that you can be a part of. <clears throat> your energy is right, but you have to get your focus together. We have to work within a system. We have to make that system work for us. Ten ones coming next year. Every, everybody who's in here needs to make sure you register to vote. Whatever it takes for you to register to vote, that's what you need to do. Whether you need to get an ID or whatever, that's what you need to do. You need to make your voices heard. Now's the time, more now than it has been in the last 50 years in this city. This is an opportunity for you to get your voices behind what you want. You will have an opportunity to elect your local representative from your neighborhood who will be directly accountable 
chance. Make it happen. Make it happen. My name is Latrice Cook, and um, I, am, I am just, I'm always concerned when I see the community events or community opportunity to speak and the community be in small numbers because it really is all our problem. It's not limited to the black problem, the Hispanic problem. It, it is all of our problem. And so I rose to say, um, first of all, before Acevedo ever came here, there were killings that were happening. And so even though I think that his, his, man, his, his way of leading has been helpful in some ways, 
uh, by seeming like he diversified the police department a little bit more. Um, I still am concerned about some of the things that are happening for sure under his leadership. But these issues were happening before Acevedo, just being fair, you know, just being fair. What I'm concerned about as a nonprofit director and founder, I work with people who have previously been incarcerated. And I think my biggest thing is where, why there are no funds being issued to entities that can best represent the needs of the people from that particular population. The funds are not, um, are, are, are very um, segregated to uh, certain organizations and entities that may not be important to this community, or that may be important, but important to a certain segment of the community. We know the things that we need in our community. We know the things that will advance those that are less fortunate than ourselves. And not only city government that does not, that needs to be uh, looked at for the inequities in funding, but also the federal government, who also has um, their hand in the plow to distribute funds and making sure that you have a bypass to state to the state agencies that you're giving this money to that are still not doling out money equitably to the different places. So I just, and I agree with what the man said earlier about going back to some things and uh, some of the, the thoughts of old. I don't see a lot of young people here and it bothers me because I'm a hunter. And you know, and I hope that, you know, my breath is picked up by somebody younger. It's, 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 and the reason why we don't see our young people, black, white, or Hispanic really involved is because they have no faith in any of the systems. We are failing our children and it just bothers me. And why is nobody from city government here? Where are, where are our, yeah, where are our elected officials and stuff? These issues have to, hi Jim, these issues have to be important to other people that we have put in office. And if what we're talking about is not important to them, they don't need to represent us. And so, you know, there has to be some pressure applied. And I do agree, this is really, it's really sad what has happened to all the people that have lost their lives at the hands of different police officers. But I don't believe everybody is racist. You know, I don't believe that. But I do believe that people have to be held accountable. Just like they hold those boys accountable when they chase them down for selling dope, they got to be held accountable. And you know, when you start charging, changing the penal code, and you start charging people with murder for their actions, they'll mm -hmm. stop shooting their guns. Mm -hmm. And I just believe that. So my, my concern is funding. Looking at the uh, how they are dispersing funds and to whom. You know, and so I think that they need to do all organizations just like nonprofits. Yes. But nonprofit organizations. I'm a nonprofit organization, but just nonprofits in general. This is not about this is not about Melch. This is about all the organizations and entities and things that people want in the community. Festivals. You know, um, how you know they support they support it and I know um, the ACL Fest and things like that. I can't think of the name of the big South by Southwest. <laughs> South by Southwest is all over in East Austin. How many of those? How many people do they employ that are African American minorities to help facilitate their events? Yeah, <laughs> you know, but they're all in East Austin using the facilities and stuff. I'm just saying that there needs to be an accountability all the way around. It's not just one part; it's just everything. And I just admire everything that everybody said. It is, it is, it is lends some value to this, and I'm enjoying it. So I'm going to just take my seat. And I, my, my thing is, please look at the funding that's being distributed.
black faces in there. It's all white folks. Behind the uh, Travis County Courthouse on 12th Street and Brazos. Yes, for the the elderly who can no longer afford their taxes and the family can't get the money together because we're all programmed to be on these programs. By design, I cannot go and speak at City Hall because they're scared of, I don't know what, you know what I mean? But that little beep, beep, beep started going off and I thought it was a bomb because I wasn't finished talking. I was like, what is this? You know, I don't understand why it's a process, why I got to have multiple people with so many decades of experience just to help me to type into the big daggone thing that I want to talk. And then it says, put in your put in your phone number first. This is a joke. This got to be a joke. Put in your phone number first to speak. Okay. Well, if you go to the little five keypad, the little ten key touch pad, you know, like we all do who are in administrative, we worked in an office, we go to the ten key. It don't work. You try the number lock. got to sign up 10 days in advance to get a deaf interpreter for a, for, to you, for you to vote that you don't want them to take your medical rights as a female. Deaf females don't get pregnant? Why, did all, why isn't that automatic? Why do you have to write out word for word what all of our complaints are? Your hand's going to fall off before I finish, before I finish. And that's not got to say what everybody else is doing. You need some media, ma'am. You need to have <coughs> a team of people taking notes for you so that each, so that each one can go and follow up on these specific stipulations, ma'am. Because I complain to the fire department, to the sheriff, to the APD. I complain verbally to everybody because this is how I communicate the best, verbally. I can't leave you a voicemail. I can't wait for you to call me back. I can't go online. I can't. I don't have any of those things. You know what I mean? So it's a problem. I've learned to take it to the A. I've learned Espanol. Because maybe they can feel where I'm trying to come from. What I'm trying to get. I'm not trying to manipulate no systems. I don't need a fraud case. I'm not trying to influence no one's emotions because I'm not here to make nobody cry. I'm not here to cry to you or nobody. But it's a problem when you gotta file the paperwork and then you gotta follow up ten days later and then you gotta be there when they call because if you're not the complaint gets dropped. Because it's another one that's hot. And it's just it's it's by design difficult for us who don't have that those resources to go online and do everything, it's a problem for us to file a complaint. If I tell the fire department, they're not telling the police department. If I get bit by a dog, APD is not telling animal control. And it's just ridiculous. When you say I'm filing complaints, like, what's your, like, I better not have a right now. Okay, you can get to talk about getting complaints to the city or city department file without going online or having to get the electronic. Yeah, why can I not say, Mr. Police, man, help me because I have this problem and they handle it. They want you to, you know, file a report, follow up on the investigation, call the detective. You can't say Baron of Grey Matter? Yes, ma'am. They'd love that. <laughs> My husband and I don't live in East Austin, but we do belong to a church in East Austin. I can't. You can say I'm a Peaceful Streets member. We came today because uh, I came here. Yeah. <laughs> Although, like the people here, we're not victims of um, police brutality or Actually, didn't get a job because of my Peaceful over, Streets involvement. So I'm careful about that now. We're very aware of it. We've been members. Uh, we've been uh, uh, members of, uh, of St. James for 15 years or so. We've lived in Austin for 50, 60 years, and we're aware of the changes that have come about in this city, and we're very concerned about them. And we came because we were especially concerned about the number of uh, African Americans who were being shot, shot in the back, and other people who, uh, whose justice, uh, for whom there there is a great injustice in East Austin. So, um, in a sense, we represent just the two of us. Uh, another part of the city that is very concerned, understands what's happening, and is very concerned. If we want to make that. I wanted to kind of summarize a little bit when I think of the four themes that I've seen go through here. But, but first of all, I don't think anybody in this room could say enough about Nelson Linder and being out in front on these issues. I have seen him at more city council meetings, more human rights commission meetings, taking on the police, often by himself. And I think we owe a lot of uh, the vigilance that we have seen in raising these issues uh, to Nelson. 
I don't want the night to go by without acknowledging that. But there are, I think, four things that I've heard tonight that all have great validity. One is the way that the city spends its funding for nonprofits and uh, it spends a lot of it in administration, frankly, that just stays at City Hall. We have uh, issues of AISD, and exactly the same thing happens with AISD. 45% of Title I money goes is in administration downtown, not in the schools. And housing, those th three themes that I think are very valid have come up tonight about uh, displacing people in, uh, on the east side. The fourth thing that I introduced at the beginning, I wanted to come back because I want to address some of the issues that I think you're going to hear tomorrow from them as excuses why they're not going to do something. Tomorrow when they meet the city council. So one of them is uh, in just anticipating what we've heard in the past is that there's not going to they're not going to accept responsibility. You, uh, the city manager, the city council have got to accept responsibility for what's going on. You can't say it's the police chief, mm -hmm. right? He's going to dance according to the music they bring, and if they tell him he has to clean up. They say you've got to follow those 155 procedures that DOJ brought down, then you'll do it. But until the city accepts that responsibility, I don't think we're going to see that happen. And the, the commission, has, the city council has got to accept that responsibility, just like it has to accept the responsibility for funding and uh, the housing that we're talking about. But until they do that, it's not gonna, we're not going to see that. And that means they've got to hold the city manager accountable. The city manager has to hold the police chief accountable. I'm not a big fan of training. I got past that a long time ago. <laughs> I think that the only that what works, the only thing that works is team, accountability. Every time there's a shooting, that supervisor in the field, in charge of that officer, needs to be as accountable as that officer. Yes. It's, it's, it, the narrative, and, the, and I think you need to tell the police chief he's got to stop his narratives. Yes. Every time there's a shooting, he's on the scene within five minutes. Yep. Blaming the victim. Yes. Blaming the victim. Oh, Mr. Jackson was thinking about maybe defrauding the bank. Yeah. I mean, how, how does that happen? Somebody goes to the bank and is dead, and that maybe it's because he was thinking perhaps of writing a bad check or whatever Acevedo's narrative was, but he does this all the time. It's not like to stand back and examine this and see what happened, what went wrong, who was to blame, and then do what should be done. But once you come out in front of the narrative the day the shooting happens that someone gets killed, he's not going to back down. The officers are going to get the message that he's supporting them, no matter what. Yep. That's the narrative. We that has got to change. And uh, until the, the city council and the police chief tell him that's got to change, he's not going to do it. And I've talked to them about it. Nelson's talked to them about it. But they haven't yet accepted that uh, responsibility. They haven't accepted the responsibility that waste, we're wasting $600,000 on the monitor's office. Totally yeah. powerless. Yeah. She appears right next to the police chief anytime there's a shooting. How can that be independent? How can, why not just give us the tax buddy back and invest it on the east side? Thank you. It would be better for justice than what we're spending uh, for the police monitor. So either that position gets teeth or gets gone, I think. And that's something the city council can do is put it back to the voters. <coughs> We passed it because we thought it was going to work, but uh, it doesn't. On the issue about living in the city, this is going to come up because police officers have a constitutional right to live outside the city, but there could be an incentive pay, right? Just like we have incentive pay for teachers who work on the east side, why not have incentive pay for the, for the officers who live in the city, right? Who live in the community don't come in as occupiers in the sense that they perceive themselves. You know, you, you talk to these young cops, and uh, no matter how much sensitivity, sensitivity training they have, they, they're so paranoid when they come into Austin, you know, because they have this mentality that there's, uh, you know, that they're not safe. I mean, which is crazy. Any of us that live on the east side know that it's, it's a fine place to live. But there's no creativity on this. They just say, oh, well, they can't, we can't force them to live in the city. They can't, but they could create an incentive. And we have the third highest paid police department in the country. <laughs>
in the safe, one of the safest cities in the country. Why do we keep needing more police helicopters and uh, cars? Why can't we have two officers in a car together? Why can't we have officers out walking the street? I mean, we have a, and, and if we're going to pay them that much, then that part of that should be the incentive to live in the city, I think. So there will be a lot of excuses tomorrow about why they can't do anything. But we've heard these all the time. Your job, take our message, is that we're tired of hearing about the excuses. Right? Tell them that they need to accept the responsibility, like Nelson's been saying. You know? And why can't we have an independent prosecutor? Why can't we have the independent prosecutor? They're going to say, well, that's a different, that belongs to the county, different jurisdiction. But if we wanted to have it, we could have it. Every officer that does any shooting always is let off the hook. I had a, I'm representing a, somebody the other day that was driving on Airport Boulevard, and the cop shot at him at traffic yeah. stop. And they said, you want to bring your client to talk to the grand jury? I said, no. Why should I? Because what you're going to do is whitewash the whole thing, like you always do, right? Because that is the way the DA has done it ever since she's been here. And if we really want to be serious about transparency and integrity, we should have an independent prosecutor in police case. Because nobody, you heard it, nobody has any confidence in the grand jury here. But Jim, this didn't start with Rosemary Lindbergh. This was the prior one too. Oh, so let's absolutely. Let's no, you're, you're right. Yeah. No. You're right. You're, you're totally right, Aura. I mean, this is institutional. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The DA has always protected the cops. Always protected the cops. Just like all the police chiefs have been bad. And by contrast, the bad police chiefs, Acevedo actually looks nice at times. But he still doesn't do his job. And he doesn't do his job because the city council and the city manager don't make him do it. Is so, he still looking for a better job like he was at one time? I don't know. <laughs> I want to share something that Jim <coughs> can tell you about. But back in 2003, we filed a title six complaint for the NACP Austin. That complaint came out all the racial shootings back then. The disparities were there. It's also a standing complaint of a revised eye shooter. So let's get our facts straight. Here's the other thing. The shoots on your right. We've had two DAs in the past, what, 40 years? Institutions. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about the fact that Charlie Barrett, a retired judge, ran for the office a few years ago. I won't tell you who didn't vote for him. So we all have a responsibility. Yep. I worked on this campaign. Here's the other thing. If you're going to detail the shootings, let's get it right. In every shooting here since 2000, we've been there. I was there with Superior King. It was not a simple case. They have a knife on the ground. That, I don't know who put it there, but they, they argue that. We fought like crazy in that case. We also, by the way, buried her with our own money. Get it right. 2003, when they shot.